And uh, I'd like to now introduce Ed Bassett. So Ed is our Chief Information Security Officer for Neosystems. He has over 32 years of cybersecurity experience. Um, you might recognize him from our CMMC Town Halls, which we uh, air every Wednesday. So Ed, I'm gonna hand it over to you if you wanna say a couple words. And thanks so much, Michael. Thanks everyone. Absolutely. All right, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Um, starting off the, with an overview panel on the CMMC life cycle. Uh, we've got both insurance and legal and regulatory perspectives uh, represented here today. Uh, I'll introduce my panel. Uh, first up is Eric Crucius, who's a partner with Holland and Knight. Uh, Eric is a Tyson's attorney who focuses his practice on a wide range of government contract matters, including bid protests, claims and disputes, compliance issues, and subprime issues. Uh, Eric has extensive experience in government contract litigation, successfully prosecuting and intervening in numerous bid protests before the U.S. Court of Federal Appeals, the GAO, uh, Boards of Contract Appeal, and other federal agencies. He counsels clients on the Service Contract Act and other labor issues, trade agreements, export controls, subcontracting and teaming agreements, and compliance with the federal acquisition regulation. Uh, Eric also represents contractors in investigations, suspension and disbarment proceedings, and in federal and state courts. He re also regularly counsels uh, companies regarding compliance with various cybersecurity regulatory requirements, including CMC. I've been on many panels with Eric, and I know he's been focused on CMC quite a bit since it uh, came out. So uh, Eric, welcome today. Um, next up is uh, Felicia Thorpe. Felicia is the managing advisor uh, for government contracting and the technology practice within AHT Insurance. Um, as a managing advisor, Felicia serves as a key relationship manager and is responsible for all aspects of the client relationship from overseeing day-to-day -day servicing to complex insurance carrier negotiations. Felicia joined AHT in 2014 with a background in strategic business consulting and business risk identification. She focuses on key risk mitigation strategies to positively impact her client's bottom line. She's also responsible for education and works to provide industry and market intelligence to clients to make sure they're informed buyers. Felicia, welcome. We're glad to have you here with us today. Thank you, Ed. So uh, I mentioned earlier, we have both legal and insurance perspectives covered. I think, you know, trying to look at CMMC as more than just a cybersecurity checklist that it is intended to be uh, something that changes the risk from a national security posture, changes risk from a business risk perspective. So I'm hoping that uh, both of you can help sort of tee that up a little bit. Um, Eric, we'll start with you. I think, um, you know, everyone at this point has um, heard the message that CMMC is going to require every company that does business with the DOD to have their cybersecurity certified by a third party assessor. Um, can you give us kind of an overview of that timeline? How do we get from where we are today, where there's zero companies that are certified to some future point where the entire defense industrial base and, and perhaps beyond has a CMMC certification? Yeah, thanks, Ed, and, and I appreciate the introduction, too. Um, with all those things, I feel a little bit of pressure now to get this right uh, in the introduction. But um, I think one point you made earlier in what you were saying about it being a, not being a checklist, I think, is a good one. And I think that's something that DOD has emphasized from the beginning, that this is supposed to be kind of more of a holistic solution than just checking a box uh, to ensure that you're compliant. Um, they're really looking for uh, contractors to be partners and to kind of take... Uh, the whole holistic approach of cybersecurity seriously. On the timeline, the, the original thought was that CMMC would be in every contract starting this, this past year, um, realizing that that was not possible. DOD has now entered into this five-year rollout plan and the uh, CMMC um, board has really, or accreditation body has gone a long way to try to stand up uh, CP3AOs, you know, the organizations that will house the assessors, uh, getting assessors trained, but that's really just launching now. I mean, they've done a lot of work. They've come a long way in a short period of time, but kind of the, the actual granular getting folks um, to be uh, assessors and qualified to be assessors, even at a level one, is just really getting going now. They've had some pathfinders, but nothing on a, on a grand scale. So it's going to take a lot of doggedness by DOD and its partners and the um, accreditation body to kind of keep pushing this forward or else we're not going to have enough uh, assessors out there. Um, I mean, there's talk, I know we're going to maybe talk about this a little bit later about other agencies also jumping on board the CMMC train. 
if that happens, that's going to further constrain the availability of assessors uh, to assess companies who need it at this time. So the ramp up is really going to be just about DOD and the board kind of staying the course, getting assessors out there, because right now demand is far outstripping what's available and it's going to become even more so uh, as time goes on, as contracts uh, have the CMMC requirement, not just from DOD, but from other agencies too. Claire, uh, just kind of a follow-up question to that. I mean, we've, we've seen um, past November, some new uh, DFARS interim rules came out, which are requiring uh, really putting a little more emphasis on compliance with the existing cybersecurity regulations that are out there. Is that just is that sort of a warm-up act for CMMC? Uh, how does that play into, into taking us down that path? Yeah, so it, it was pretty interesting. I mean, I think there's a recognition that CMMC is, is going to take a little bit of time. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a five-year roll-up plan. And in the interim, DOD is obviously very concerned that um, CUI or controlled defense information that's out there is not being properly protected. So they, they issue these two other clauses, which nobody really knew were coming out until a week or two before there were rumors of it. Um, but, uh, you know, those, what those clauses do is they allow DOD to come in and for high, medium or high risk contracts to do kind of a, their own assessment of the contractor's compliance with uh, NIST 800-171. And that will hopefully give DOD some confidence that the riskier contracts are being looked over properly by contractors and they're properly certifying. Because you know, this whole thing started because DOD essentially didn't believe the contractor certifications that they were compliant with 800-171. So CMMC is there to kind of act as a third party, um, to have a third party, you know, show that there is compliance. And these other DFARS clauses that came out kind of unexpectedly to kind of be there while CMMC fully rolls up is, um, is, is a good way to kind of get, get started in that. But contractors should know that, you know, what they're signing up for by having these clauses in their contract, they're agreeing that if DOD finds that their contract is medium or high risk based on the contract, itself, not necessarily the contractor, they're agreeing to have DOD come in and do a, um, an assessment of their compliance with 800-171 and, and seeing if their certifications were in fact accurate. That's a good point. And, and those, those um, unlike CMMC, where the contractor would plan that out and know that they're ready before they hire, um, these assessments that you mentioned could be done by, will be done by the DIBGAC, the uh, Defense Industrial-Based Cybersecurity Assessment Center. And these are government agents who will decide who and when and where to, to audit. So uh, not a total surprise, but not something planned by the contractor. Right. That's a good point. The CMMC, you know, your certification is coming up. You know, you're getting ready for it. You're preparing. You know, I imagine that these audits um, will be on far shorter notice than that. Well, that definitely puts people on, on notice a little bit. Um, Felicia, I'm going to shift it over to you to kind of introduce the insurance component. There's minimum insurance requirements for DOD contractors, as, as in many commercial contracts. But to Eric's point earlier, it's more than just sort of checking the box. It's more, more to it than just sort of meeting that minimum standard. Give us a feel for how insurance fits into the cyber uh, security equation for DOD contractors. Sure. So of course, every government contractor has to adhere to the FAR requirements that they're put out there. And in a lot of cases, your contract officer can or does not have to put in those specific uh, requirements. It's up to you as the contractor to know what is required. So as we've seen uh, more events happening, you know, cyber breaches can take place in any shape or form at this point. Um, we've seen that the government has imposed some additional contract requirements that we hadn't pre previously seen. So technology errors and emissions, if you're a technology company, um, if you're not, it's gonna be known as cyber, a standalone cyber policy, but they're looking for ways to transfer the risk from themselves to the contractor. So that comes in with, uh, you know, notification if there's a, any type of event and there's personal protected information that's at risk or uh, personal health information or credit card information, they do have a requirement to notify. And uh, when it came down to some of these more well-known breaches, things like OPM, it was really understood at that point the type of financial harm it could cause an agency by not having that provision put in place, especially since it wasn't specifically the government that caused it. So, you know, I think a lot of people understand that, um, you know, the impetus between, be, behind CMMC was protecting or safeguarding QE. And I think insurance is on the backside can be safeguarding your business. And so it's essentially just giving you a way to shift the liability from your bottom line to a third party if and when, which is 
often used, that's a term often used in insurance, if and when this happens. So um, I kind of put this out to, to both of you. Um, you know, we both mentioned kind of doing more than the minimum and why you might want to do that. Obviously for, for insurance, for cybersecurity, for all these things, there's cost involved, but there's also some benefits. What are some of the business benefits that companies see besides the obvious benefit of being qualified to go after DOD contracts, right? So beyond, you know, beyond even that uh, as the main goal, I think for getting certified, um, what are the other benefits that people are perceiving? Yeah, I mean, I can say from my standpoint, one of the things that people find is that on an annual basis, business insurance is just something that you have to pay for. And if you are dealing in technology at all, your professional liability, which is also known, again, as your technologies, errors, and emission policy, is underwritten by the carrier. So if you're looking at it from their perspective, if you're looking at a company who is taking the bare minimum in terms of what they're doing to protect their networks versus someone who's really putting a fair amount of thought and contemplation into how they can protect that information, you can see that from their standpoint, they're going to evaluate the latter as a better risk. And that's gonna be translated into your premiums. Um, and then beyond that, premiums are also calculated based off of your loss experience. So I think there are a lot of companies out there that just sort of anticipated that if they were doing the bare minimum, it would be unlikely that they would have any type of cyber event. And that hasn't been the case. Um, we oh, are no. seeing so many things. I mean, I, I on a any number uh, of business days can get a call about something that I'd never heard about in terms of cyber events. And so with that, the carriers have to pay out. So if you were doing these things to protect your network, to protect your employees, uh, to protect your information, chances are the carrier is not going to have to pay out. When they do pay out and they go back through that underwriting process, you will see it for three to five years in your premiums. And uh, I'll just add to, to your question, Ed. I mean, every contractor that's listening today, their, their goal is to win more work from the government and um, doing more than the bare minimum um, often is helpful because we're seeing a lot of kind of um, things written into uh, RFPs, which require cybersecurity compliance. Many of the agencies themselves have their own cybersecurity requirements, uh, aside from DOD and aside from the FAR. Um, and I think uh, contracting agencies are looking to be assured that if they're going to do business, especially when um, contract defense information or CUI is involved, that their information is going to be protected. And we're seeing it occasionally um, where um, the kind of the who gets chosen to be the contractor is based off of partially at least on your cybersecurity compliance and how well you're protecting things. They want assurances that um, that this is not going to backfire on them aside from all the regulatory requirements. So being kind of up and uh, on top of everything cyber related and, and compliance and going above and beyond can actually be business differentiator. differentiator differentiator too. So, um, you know, really um, it's, it's not just a cost center, you know, it's also something that can help your competitive advantage. A uh, quick note is that I think it's fair to uh, point out that while this is the CMMC and, you know, this is related to the DOD, I know that GSA is contemplating risk assessments too. I think this is the beginning of what will be a long-term goal for the government. And we all know when the government starts some certain process that also will translate to commercial later on down the line. So it's, I, I hate the idea that people are thinking of this simply in terms of DOD because inevitably it will, you know, cross the lines of other agencies and into commercial space. Yeah, that I mean, that's um, something that we've seen already, even though it is a fairly new initiative, is interest from other sectors, uh, other agencies within the government, and um, and potentially the potential for commercial recognition um, by folks that are certainly not mandated to do it. Um, Eric, is that is that something that 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 you've seen, and, and do you think that is a valid reason for companies that may not be, um, you know, relying on the DoD for their revenues to still look at CMC as a, as a benchmark to achieve? Yes, I, I do, and I think if any if there's any contractor listening out there who you know doesn't really have much DoD work but is is heavily in the government contract space in a civilian space, you know, don't worry about going and getting assessed tomorrow but certainly go out and start worrying about whether you're gonna be compliant or not with based on the information that you house um, for the government or you create. Um, because you know, we're seeing interest from DHS, um, you know, Katie Arrington who's speaking later um, talked about that as uh, that DHS looks like there is gonna be the next agency to follow suit on the CMMC train. Uh, GSA, as Felicia mentioned a little bit earlier, 
is uh, interested in, in maybe putting CMMC in some government-wide acquisitions, which is not surprising because their government-wide vehicles sell, you know, DOD buys from the, those vehicles. So um, if DOD has to, you know, is requiring CMMC compliance on their standalone contracts, why wouldn't they not require it on schedule contracts or, or even NASA Super or something like that? So um, it's not surprising at all. So I think folks who are civilian contractors really need to pay attention to this as well, because what we're seeing as this ramps up through DOD, I think other agencies, if they see it going well, are gonna start kind of catching on and starting, start becoming invested in this in this standard and it could wind up being the government-wide standard. One thing, um, I wanna see if this is uh, what your advice is on this, Eric. I've seen, talked to some companies that don't have controlled unclassified information, therefore not required to do CMOC level three, uh, but they look at CMMC level one, it's a very basic level of security. It's a very basic capability. As they look at differentiator, they don't see it as much of a differentiator. So they're looking to go after level three. Is Do you think that's wise? Do you think that they'll, um, well, they're going to hopefully have better security risk experience, right? Hopefully hopefully they have, to please you, your point earlier, they would have better time with their underwriting and less, less loss experience. Um, but they also think it may show a sort of a higher level of capability. Do you think that's uh, that's a, a good move? I mean, I think that's somewhat fair. I mean, going for a level three assessment can be somewhat expensive. So, you know, if, if I'm a, a company that really currently doesn't have CY, um, I, I would look at my pipeline and say, okay, these are the contracts over the next five, seven years that we're interested in, you know, going after or obtaining or vehicles that we want to be on. And, um, or our GSA schedule, DOD buys off of it a lot. If, if those are the kinds of things that are happening, um, then perhaps a level three certification is, is wise as a differentiator. But if, you know, if the contractor is doing something that's non-technical, like um, is maintaining the lawns in front of a military base, um, which is great work, but it's not something that you have CUI for, and that's all that the contractor is ever going to do, I don't think having a level three um, a CMMC assessment is not is going to be a differentiator or very helpful unless there's a particular security risk or security issue involved. Um, so I think it just kind of depends on the posture of the company. But they they could very well be benefited by having a level three certification, even if they don't have any level three contracts right now. Got it. Um, got an audience question I want to work in because it goes to the time the timeline we were talking about earlier. Um, and I just I, I forgot to mention at the start for audience members you can use the uh, for the question and answer submit your questions and upvote. Then the questions that are getting upvoted are the ones that we're gonna to try to get on the air. So um, the question is, how will contractors be selected for assessment when the assessors become available, especially if we have recompetes coming up? Um, so um, I'll throw to you, Eric. I think, you know, do you, have you any word in terms of how that's gonna play into the timeline? Is this gonna be based on contracts or is it like you just talked about people who may be doing it on a voluntary basis? Um, how do you think that's gonna play out in, in the, next year or so? So that's long been an issue that, um, you know, I haven't seen an entirely clear answer on that. I mean, a part of me thinks it's just going to be the marketplace and there's hopefully enough assessors out there um, that can pick up the work, um, you know, when contractors have recompetes coming up or have, have new contracts coming up that they want to compete for. I mean, the expectation is from DOD at least has been that if you have a contract that's coming up for recompete or you want to be a new contractor or a subcontractor, um, you should be able to get assessed before uh, um, work would start. So assessment is not required to bid on a contract, but uh, CMMC certification is only required once the contract is awarded and work starts. So there's a little bit more time there if you know you're going to bid on a contract to get that, because it's really the CMMC certification process they're expecting to be about a six month process or a little bit less, but up to six months. Uh, and right now there's no priority setting for folks who um, have contracts already um, and they'd be up for a recompete of a, a contract that now has CMMC in it. Um, I would hope that if there aren't enough assessors to go around, that that's something that DOD does and steps in and, and prioritizes those contractors who are bidding on those contracts. Um, but I haven't seen a clear um, decision on that yet. And maybe it should be a little bit too early and that's why. Let me, let me open it up and kind of broaden this out. We've got, um, we've got a new administration in um, how, for both of you, how do you see the cybersecurity outlook uh, and CMC specifically, but cybersecurity in general, how do you see that uh, changing under the Biden administration? 
So from my standpoint, realistically, I mean, I think we've been all waiting to see how this is gonna play out since the Obama administration. I think a lot of this uh, started with 800-171, uh, some other pieces that, you know, as far as regulation is concerned, um, I, I would like to believe that the administrations are all aiming towards the same end goal. And I think that there has been a lot of focus on that and whether or not, you know, we're obviously looking at it from the insurance standpoint, um, looking to see if we would have any expansion of requirement for insurance. Um, there's been a back and forth between the government saying that they believe that the insurance industry should be pushing. And we think that, you know, perhaps the government should be mandating, uh, but it's the idea that there are other insurance policies which are backed by the government. And given the level of foreign actors involvement with a lot of these cyber events, it could be very beneficial to the government to take a stronger place in, you know, saying this is what's required to protect our information. Um, you know, especially as we see this play out with the solar winds uh, breach and some of the other things that we've seen happen. Uh, but I have every reason to believe and hope that we will continue in the same direction and, and perhaps maybe even see if it will turn about at a quicker pace uh, before we see the next biggest hack we've ever experienced. So um, yeah, and, and I, I agree with what Felicia is saying. And I think to just build upon it really briefly, um, you know, there, there were some folks in the Obama administration um, who were kind of critical of CMMC as a model on how to go about fixing um, the cybersecurity issue that we have. But those folks are not in the Biden administration like, like was possible. Um, I don't see CMMC changing drastically at all. It's, if, if the Biden administration does anything, it's probably going to be at the margin. So, you know, I think um, uh, Katie Arrington, who you'll hear from later, I, you know, has said that um, every, every indication that they've had is that they're plowing forward on the same course. And I have no reason to see otherwise. I think uh, the, this administration is going to do that. And we'll, we may even see additional regulations or requirements on the uh, civilian side, if not CMMC. You know, I'm very surprised actually that the civilian side doesn't have a, um, a, DFARS, uh, re a DFARS like requirement, you know, which requires compliance with 800 171. And part of me believes that that's because they're waiting to see if the CMMC pans out well enough that they're going to, the agencies, agencies on the civilian side will just start jumping on board. That's a good point. Very good. Uh, Felicia, um, you know, we focus a lot uh, in the cybersecurity world on prevention but incidents still happen. And when it comes to responding to a cyber incident, that's when the insurance companies uh, play, a, play a big role. What, what does this look like and how should companies prepare for effective involvement of their insurance carrier? And I'll say not just after an incident, because that's probably too late to have the first conversation. So pre and, 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 and post incident, uh, how do they engage with their insurance carrier on these topics? Right. So I wanna just start by saying that there is a general feeling that insurance is the bad guy. And I understand where that comes from, but in an effort to kind of get people over that hump, I always explain to my clients, you want to involve the insurance carrier. There is an absolute, there's an absolute benefit to the carrier to know what's happening and to understand your business from the beginning. If they can provide you resources, um, whether that's, you know, like pre-breach, pre let's use that as an ex uh, example, they have a lot of resources they can go through with you. Many of the carriers will help you create an incident response plan. Many of them will go through an assessment of your software, hardware, mobile device plans. Uh, they'll do tabletop exercises. Some of them will do penetration testing. They benefit from you not having a claim. So there are a lot of things that they have built in and it's just a matter of people understanding that that's available to them. Once a claim has happened, I think what what a lot of companies go into is sort of like a, a crisis mode. You need to make sure that you are responding to your carrier nearly immediately. Many of these carriers have provisions that say you have to report within a certain period of time once it's known. And it's really important that if you know that you are dealing with a certain type of um, legal team that you continuously work with, that you pre-breach, talk with your carrier about, do we wanna use what's called a panel counsel? Is it somebody who we know very well and they're a you know, national team? It's a pre-negotiated rate that the carrier has with their uh, legal team. And so they'll say, hey, here's different ones that you can use and they all have a great reputation. But let's say you're using, let's say uh, Eric, and you've always dealt with Eric, you know Eric is a, does a great job and you wanna utilize him, you can go through the carrier to get them approved. They just essentially have to make sure there's no conflict of interest. And then there's a negotiation of fees. 
So I have run into several scenarios in which they've just gone down a different path than what the carrier would want them to do. And that causes issues because if the path that your existing legal team is taking is not financially benefit to the carrier, it can void your coverage. So we just want to make sure that if you're keeping in touch with your broker and making sure that, hey, here's what we're looking at. Here's what we want to achieve. Um, we're going to go to the carrier, let them know we're taking this seriously. We're CMMC3 certified. We've got all these things in place. Then at the time that uh, an actual claim comes about, you can reach out to your claims uh, whoever the, the contact is and really go through that process. And then at that point, they can assign you um, several resources. Uh, I don't know if you guys are all familiar with the regulation uh, 252.204, but it actually does, you know, kind of line out. Like you need to make sure that you have forensic investigation, forensic accounting, you need to have notification. And those things are all in many cases covered under your first party expenses of your technology, you know, or professional liability or cyber policy. Well, incident, yeah, the reporting you mentioned that the DFARS clause you quoted, uh, you know, has the incident reporting requirements mm -hmm. uh, that apply to all contractors today. And as they move that towards CMMC, uh, there's a requirement to make that even, you know, more institutionalized, more planning. And I'll say that, um, you know, as a practitioner who, who does this a lot, I, I don't see insurance companies or involved in the discussion around in, in incident planning, the pre-planning, um, as much as what you're suggesting would, would make sense. So I think that's that's good advice. As you're putting together your incident response plan uh, and thinking about who needs to be involved, we all think about our technical responders, but uh, you know, there's there's other folks too, and insurance should be should be part of that. It sounds like. Right. Absolutely. And I and I do just want to mention that a lot of what's required that you do can be a pretty penny. So I've had people uh, in hindsight recognize that they had paid out for a lot of these services without recognizing that their insurance would in fact pay on their behalf. And they either needed to work on getting reimbursed, whereas in some cases it would have been, you know, out-of-pocket expense would have been avoided altogether. Oh, that's very good. Um, Eric, I think um, looking at your work in the legal side, I think most folks think of the legal aspect of CMMC to revolve on the early stages, you know, determining applicability, scope, what does the regulation mean to me, that sort of thing. Uh, but what about in the case of incident we were just talking about, is, what's the role for legal advisors pre and post incident to help make that make that clear? Yeah, well, so for pre-incident, I mean, the, the, the role that we can play is we help, you know, companies kind of go through and understand, not just me, but any any legal advisor who's in this area, um, what are the requirements under the DFARS and the FAR and the different agency uh, things, different agency regulations, because what happens is a lot of times contractors put in a bid through an RFP, you know, maybe read the, um, you know, those contract, those uh, RFPs can be quite long, 80, 100 more pages with uh, all kinds of uh, word salad uh, regulatory requirements. And they, you know, it's easy to miss maybe an agency specific um, requirement. So helping, you know, understanding what those requirements are, understanding, all right, I have this contract with the IRS, so I have a one hour breach requirement, breach notification requirement. Having those ducks in a row, so that way, whatever is in the RFP that you've signed yourself up to do is now part of your corporate policy along the way. So that's one thing uh, in advance that, that contractors want to do. Also, just um, to Felicia's point, kind of getting those service providers in place, not necessarily paying for them, but entering into agreements that if we have a breach, this is our team. And that way, um, if there is a breach, you're not trying to find that team uh, after the fact uh, when you don't have time to find such a team. So that's, that's also a helpful thing as well. On the post-breach side, a lot of times lawyers are brought in um, partially because we work under attorney-client privilege and you know, opinions that we render are, are protected. And by, by running kind of the helping run the breach response, we can bring some of those conversations that may otherwise be discoverable by the government or third parties uh, under the under the Dane of attorney client privilege. Of course, you, you know, just to if you're doing something just to bring it under attorney client privilege and the, and the attorneys there just for show, it's probably not going to be held up in court uh, as something that's protected. But, um, you know, the, the attorneys can come in and kind of determine you know, what are the regulatory disclosure requirements? What are the legal disclosure requirements? Every state has a disclosure requirement if uh, PII is involved, for instance, and there are other industry specific disclosure requirements. Um, so, you know, we, you know, attorneys can come in and help kind of untangle that mess and figure out what the contractor or company needs to do uh, if there is a breach uh, along the way. And of course, there are the, the requirements that I talked about, like the IRS has a one hour turnaround 
um, you have the DFARS requirement as well uh, for a response, uh, you know, to let the DIBnet know that you've had a breach. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of things to think about if there is a breach along the way. Well, Eric, you, you mentioned, you know, when is the, the right time to be lining those people up and having those initial conversations is not after the breach. I remember a few years ago, I read of a breach that, you know, happened, I read a release on a breach that happened on Christmas Eve, and the victim was saying in their press release that they were hiring, uh, you know, responders, consultants on Christmas Day. And I, I thought to myself, man, I can't imagine a worse thing to have to do on Christmas Day than to go out and hire uh, some incident responders. So, you know, now all of our uh, all of our exercises involve a, an attack right at the worst possible time. That's when they always happen, right? So, um, very important, I think, to get your insurance advisors, your legal advisors, your, your responders, your security advisors all lined up um, well before. A uh, couple audience questions I want to work in here. Um, one is, uh, I think, for both of you, with regards to risk and contractors obtaining insurance, what is the penalty imposed upon contractors by the government? or any CUI breaches? Um, so I can't talk to the insurance side, but um, you know, if there is a breach of some kind, if, and the government has found out that, you know, if, if, you, if there's been a breach and it's been no fault of the contractor, then there's probably no discernible penalty, although DOD under the DFARS-7012 uh, clause has a right to come in and do an investigation. And to that point, you wanna keep, if you have CUI, you wanna keep that on a discrete server so the, you know, first of all, it's just best practice, but also if DOD does an investigation after a breach, it's limited to that server and doesn't go enterprise wide. Um, so that's the, that's the first thing to think about. But from a, a, a risk standpoint, you know, if, if there is a breach and DOD does an investigation and finds out you've been certifying compliance with 800-171 and you're not complying either just through negligence or sheer, you know, I'm gonna just say I'm compliant and I know I'm not, then there's uh, you know other issues, contract termination, um, false claims act violations. You know the parade of horribles goes on. So you know you want to be very careful about the certifications that you that you um, that you make. And Felicia, from an insurance perspective, are I would assume those kind of penalties are not something that would be protected by insurance. Well, actually, you know it depends on what comes through, but there is actual insurance coverage for uh, regulatory. Um, you know, you're basically looking at regulatory penalties and fines can be can be covered. Um, right. But I would say that's situational because in a lot of cases, you can find the difference between something that was intentional or known about or, you know, so really that's one of those situations where it really has to be taken case by case. There's no, um, no penalty from insurance for not having that in place, but certainly I think all government contractors have a, a base understanding that you don't want to get blacklisted for not having been compliant with your previous contracts and awards. Got it. Uh, audience question about uh, the role of breach coaches. So you mentioned earlier, can you comment a little bit more on the role of, of breach coaches and how you can engage those yeah. resources? So one of the things that we'll do prior to any type of event, it's mostly like a, a, upon renewals or if replacing somewhere um, that might be like a new carrier, is that we'll go through the resources available through the carrier. Now, uh, a breach coach is somebody that is, you know, contracted with the carrier and can really walk through the steps of what happens when you have a breach. So there are certain things that people may never think of. A good example is making sure that your employee base knows how to correctly direct any questions to the appropriate people. Um, we've had several scenarios in which uh, somehow the press has gotten wind of something that might have happened internally, and then they catch an employee off guard. And the employee in an attempt to try to help out the organization is giving what, you know, any type of answer. It may not be in line with what the PR firm would, would want to have out there. As a government contractor, you certainly want to be protecting your reputation. So these are sort of things that the breach coach goes through and says, all right, you've got your incident response plan. Does your employee base know that if any questions come their way to direct them to your marketing director or your COO? Um, if something is detected, where are you going to go in terms of notification first? How do you engage your insurance brokers? Um, how do you announce to the carrier that this is what's happened? And how do you move forward with your legal team? So I think a lot of people have built a really strong incident response plan, but the breach coach can kind of go through step by step and help them understand outside pieces. Also, after a breach has happened, they can walk them through the same thing. Um, I think when things actually happen, it's a different scenario than when you practice it. 
and they'd rather have you have a resource that can make sure you're doing the right things to mitigate their cost. Good, good advice. Um, Eric, I want to uh, shift gears a little bit and ask you about uh, some of the practicalities around CMMC implementation. As, as this is appearing and, and certification is becoming a reality, uh, there's some practical aspects that people are wrestling with that seem, seem to kind of remain challenging. And uh, the two are inheritance um, and flow down. So a contractor that's looking to get certified may rely on service providers to do some of their security functions. It's very common, cloud providers or, or managed service providers. And similarly, um, you know, contractors um, under the DFARS need to flow down CMMC to all their subcontractors that would handle any um, FCI or CUI. Um, is there, in your view, is there a timing dependency for this? Is it necessary for service providers and cloud providers to be certified before contractors can rely on them for their own certification? Um, not necessarily, but the services that those cloud providers are going to provide to that contractor um, would have to be, you know, compliant with CMMC. So for instance, um, you know, CMMC is essentially a whole of organization compliance review. And perhaps the cloud provider is only providing 10% of what their organization does to essentially um, to the contractor. And in that instance, you know, you know the CMMC requirement um, may not be there for that service provider, but it certainly does help. I mean, I think what one thing DOD is looking to doing is looking at those service providers and getting them CMMC certification. So if X company uses Neosystems, for instance, um, DOD can skip all those check boxes as long as whatever Neosystems does is implemented properly uh, with that contractor. And it'll certainly make things easier, but I don't think there's necessarily going to be a requirement that, you know, a large company is CMMC certified. Um, what DOD is going to, I would assume do is have the assessors kind of look at holistically, all right, this, this provider is, is, this cloud provider is providing X to this contractor is what that is that X, uh, good enough to be CMMC certified, just as if it was with the contractor itself. Um, and in that instance, you know, it's going to, it's not going to save a lot of time on the certification process. Uh, on the other hand, if that provider was, um, CMMC certified, I think that would shortcut um, a lot of the uh, certification process uh, for all those check boxes that you need to have. So it, it's not an entirely clear answer at this point because we're still building up um, to uh, the mature system that we're all seeking uh, in the near term. But I, I do think um, you know, um, having those third parties be CMMC certified would be extremely helpful. I do want to point out, Eric, you make a really good point about, you know, the vendor relationship. I think that also from an insurance standpoint, um, we want to make sure that there's flow down. Uh, when you think about liability, if you are if you are responsible as the prime to meet this requirement, then you also want to make sure that your subcontractors are as well, that the insurance requirements that you have on your side are also being flowed down because if they have access to the same information as your employees and it is their error or omission that causes uh, third party damage, or a breach that you're able to flow down that responsibility and it's not coming out of your bottom line. Uh, that also is the same uh, thought, line of thought when it comes to mergers and acquisitions. Having a CMMC, I think really will go a long way to show that you've done the right things on in your network and protecting information so that if you're being acquired, uh, there is a, a history you can look back and show good cyber hygiene and you can put together a tail policy which will basically cap the purchaser's liability going forward. So it's a matter of just transferring liability back and forth in the CMMC, I think just points to people taking the right steps to protect themselves. Absolutely, that's a great point. And the, the flow down point is really important that you bring up because the CMMC DFARS clause is going to require the CMMC clause to be flowed down all the way down through the supply chain. So even though, you know, DOD originally anticipated 10 contracts being having CMMC in it for this fiscal year, um, they thought that would require about a thousand contractors get a CMMC certification because you not just you don't just have the prime contractor, you have all the prime competitors who are going for that contract as well as all their subcontractors all the way down the supply chain, and it only stops when the contractor is only providing Cox products. That's the really the only exception to CMMC. So um, you know that flow down is going to be a very important, and you'll have a lot of folks who are companies who said. I don't do any business with the federal government. This doesn't impact me. We'll find out 
when they get a subcon draft subcontract agreement from a prime contractor that in fact does involve them. Right. Um, I've got an audience question about cost. It says, as a small business, is there any way to protect ourselves from the exorbitant costs that are mounting to become compliant? Um, so yes and no. Um, DOD has said that the cost of compliance um, can be, you know, essentially uh, recoverable when you win a contract award, but you have to win the contract award. So this is going to be an upfront cost. Um, you know, DOD has been very careful to say that the, the level one certification is not going to be an expensive endeavor and the regulations that were served uh, kind of borne that out. But on the other hand, um, you know, a small business, any when you have small margins, any kind of cost is really um, is 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 difficult for a small business, especially in this competitive environment. So you know there is an there is an investment by the small business um, in order to get this government business. Um, so you know small businesses have to look to say, all right, is this worthwhile? Um, there are it's going to be a drop off of companies who are willing to do business with the federal government because of that. And you know DOD's position is well, if they're not willing to 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 undergo this task, then maybe we don't want to do business with them because they're not willing to spend the money to be cybersecurity compliant. Uh, on the other hand, you know, these businesses um, are already investing a lot in doing business with the government, and this is just an additional cost. So um, well, all I can say to the small businesses is try to amortize this uh, requirement over time. If you start kind of getting ready for it now, it's not going to be as much of a shock, the upfront cost, because you're, you're investing in the systems to be compliant over a longer period of time. Uh, and that kind of will kind of make it a little bit more palatable. Um, but also, you know, don't necessarily rely on the costs and the regulations that are put out. You know, they, they of course, do their very best to try to figure out how much is this going to cost contractors uh, when we put out this regulation. Um, and there's not a recognition, I think, within the regulations themselves as they were drafted that, you know, even if you're getting a level one requirement, you're going to have service providers involved, folks um, you know, high up in the food chain of the company involved. Those are all costs that are there. Um, not just, um, you know, an employee who's on the ground, um, who doesn't have any contact with management or, or outside counsel or outside, um, insurance or cybersecurity providers. So, you know, there's no easy answer for this. Um, the, the best thing I could say is that if you want to do business with the federal government as a small business, start working on this now. So the costs that you have are spread out, spread out over a longer period of time. Yeah, I would, I would add that there are going to be contract requirements. I would only anticipate that we'll see more of those flowing down as far as cyber requirements. And in many cases, what we have worked with some of our smaller clients to do is to identify what that cost is going to be prior to them really putting a lot of effort into the proposal. So when you get contracts or if you're looking at proposals, you can send it to your broker, have them price it out. And we can go back to the contract officer and see if, if they are willing to negotiate the amount of limit. I, you know, sometimes they're just working from a temp template. So if they've got a big contractor on uh, something and they say, oh, wow, we want $10 million worth of, uh, of professional liability, that's not feasible for a smaller organization. And so if we can look at what's actual in terms of the exposure and go back and negotiate a bit, it, it can be a little bit more palatable. It also can be built into your long-term insurance spend. But I don't see a scenario in which we're going backwards. Uh, we are definitely going to be working forward in terms of risk man management and mitigation. And I think that this is going to be an impetus for commercial space and more government agencies. So I, I totally agree with Erica as this being something you start to put in as part of your expense business expenses. Very good. I've got one more audience question. I'm going to uh, direct to you, Eric, and then I'll, I'll have a, a wrap up. We've got about five minutes left, so I have a wrap up question for, for both of you. Um, this is an audience question. What are, you, what are your thoughts on the idea that CMMC compliance will be hard for small businesses? Is it true or somebody, simply, simply a myth? Sorry, I'm mangling that. Is it true or simply a myth? I mean, it, so there's no easy answer because it's not one size fits all. I think companies that are kind of in this space, in the uh, IT space or cybersecurity space, they won't find it especially difficult. Um, for the companies that it's difficult for, there are plenty of third party providers out there um, who can help along the way uh, to not make it technically difficult. The, the 800 171, if you're going for a level three certification or, or need to um, be compliant with 800 171, if you open up the document and look through the checklist of what you're required to do, it's written in plain English. It's not too difficult to kind of understand and read. And, you know, 
sitting at your desk on, uh, or I guess at home now, and, and kind of going through that checklist and saying, okay, we do this, we do this, we do this. And then you could start doing your own informal gap analysis and seeing what you don't do. And those things that you don't do, how difficult they would be to do. Um, and I think that's a good place to start because it, it, it's, there's a lot out there that makes it seem like it's more than it is. And just boiling it down to the basics and seeing, okay, this is a checklist of what we have to accomplish, um, kind of brings it home and makes it seem a lot less daunting. So I think it's accessible for everybody that's out there, especially folks who are in the IT space. Um, but if you just take simple steps to kind of perform your own gap analysis and then going out and finding um, you know, what, what you need to do, I think makes it a lot easier. I, it is in English, but there is some dense reading in there, I have to say. Um, yeah. especially for people who are not, you know, in the, in the cybersecurity business as their, as their core function. So I think, you know, um, get some experts involved, right? Um, yep. to, to wrap up today, I, I want to uh, go back to the life cycle uh, question um, of where we are right now. We've got a lot of stuff in flux, right? So the CMC standard is, is fairly new. It's still being digested. We've got further guidance forthcoming in some areas that you mentioned a couple of uh, on the panel today. Uh, we have a new administration, there's a pandemic going on. There's a lot of reasons to maybe say, this is not the top priority. So my, my question for both of you is, is it okay to wait until things settle out a bit? Uh, from my standpoint, the answer is no. Uh, quite honestly, we are in what's considered a hard market, which means the way that the uh, markets are trending is that premiums are going up. We're actually really encouraging our clients to look at the next three to five years and anticipate if we are going to really be in this space and we want to protect ourselves adequately, should we be looking at higher limits? If you are doing anything in the tech field, I would say that it is almost immediate that you need to be purchasing either a tech E&O policy, professional liability, or cyber to protect yourself. I think it is inevitable that people will experience some sort of cyber event. And the cost right now uh, is far more than it was last year. And with this pandemic, people working from home, um, new and exciting, uh, different types of uh, foreign events, it really is imperative that people start looking at how they're going to transfer this risk um, from their bottom line to a third party, which is an insurance carrier. Eric, two minutes. Okay, uh, you're asking a lawyer to only talk for two minutes. I'll give him my best <laughs> shot though. It'll only cost you $300. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, the, the thing is this, um, even if the Biden administration came in and kind of scrapped CMMC as a whole, right, and said, we're not, not going to do this anymore, which there's no indication that that's going to happen, 800-171 is still there, and that's really the core of CMMC. So no matter what, contractors are going to have to be compliant with these cybersecurity requirements, no matter what form it takes. So even uh, with, you know, uncertainty that surrounds every time a new administration comes in, um, you know, these, these requirements are not going to go backwards. They're only going to go forward. So even if things change how they're structured, maybe there's no accreditation body after the Biden administration is done. Although again, there's been no, um, there's been no hint of that. There's still going to be a requirement to comply with these, um, you know, 110 requirements if you're going to have CUI or, or uh, controlled defense information. That's not going to change. Um, so, you know, as we go along, just being compliant will allow you to be on the board, on board and ready to go, no matter what form the government regulation takes, you have the structure in place to be compliant and to be ready to go. Well, thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Felicia. Really good information today. Uh, thanks to the audience for your, your time and attention.